All of the circuits I've done so far in the previous videos were constructed from, from gates. Uh, gates can only make what are called combinational logic circuits. Uh, combinational logic is a system in which the output is dependent only on what the present inputs are. There's no feedback from output to some part of the input circuits. They are time independent. There isn't any clock with them. There may be a, something to activate them, but they are time independent. And they are all done with Boolean statements. Now the next set of circuits that we're going to deal with, these are going to be implementing flip-flops and latches. These are called sequential logic circuits. Uh, sequential logic circuits are the first devices that you're going to deal with that have a memory function. They actually will remember what the previous state was and can hold on to this bit of data for as long as you want to, as long as power is applied, of course. But in these, the output is dependent not only what the inputs are, but as well as what the current output is, because those are fed back into the device to, for it to consider as part of its functions. There are two types of sequential logic circuits. These are latches and flip-flops. A latch is an asynchronous device. It doesn't have a, a timing function in it. It might have an enable function, but it doesn't have a timing function. These are, these are also time-independent devices. But unlike the combinational circuits, they do have a memory function, so they will remember the previous state. Flip-flops, on the other hand, do have some kind of a, a clock to synchronize the system. So they're called synchronous devices. Now, the definition for latches as asynchronous devices and flip-flops as synchronous devices is relatively new. Uh, probably no more than 10, 15, maybe 20 years. If you go back farther than that, the terms latch and flip-flop were used interchangeably, so it really didn't matter. I kind of fall into the latter category, so I'll uh, tend to use both phrases, but I'll, I'll try to keep everything <laughs> relatively uh, straightforward uh, and contemporary. A flip-flop has some unique conditions that have to be met for it to operate properly. When a clock pulse is applied to the circuit, and that's shown here in the, with the black line, the data has ha would have had to have been at a, at a certain level for a period of time before it's, it's valid. The amount of time that the data has to be at a certain level before the clock pulse is called the setup time. Then the data also has to be level during the, the read time of the circuit. And this is called the hold time. So there's a period then, beginning of the setup time to the end of the hold time, that the value of the input data has to be steady for it to have a valid output. The combination of setup time and hold time is called aperture time. The first latch that I'm going to discuss is the, is the NAND latch, and it has two inputs, which are called set and reset. Sometimes you'll see this uh, reset also named uh, clear. If you do, it, it really doesn't make a difference. The, the term is used interchangeably. So we have the two inputs, set and reset, which means we have a total of four possible combinations that we can have for the input. And we have outputs that are labeled Q and Q bar or Q naught. These values, Q and, and Q naught, they must always be complementary. That means if this output is a 1, this output must be 0. Or if this is a 0, this one must be 1. They're never allowed to be both a, a 1 and a 1, or a, a 0 and a 0. These are prohibited conditions. It's not something that, uh, that you want to see in, in these circuits. As far as uh, the naming of these outputs being Q, uh, it's not absolutely certain where the Q came from, but it's thought that in computer systems in which there is an output that has a certain state, in computer systems the output is called Q.
So the, uh, the state equals Q, and that apparently made its way into digital electronics, and uh, we've, been, we've been using it or stuck with it since, uh, since then. So I'm going to start by putting in uh, just some values. Uh, let's put in uh, a 1 and a 0 uh, as, as our outputs. Now notice that the drawing here, and this is typically the way you would see uh, an SR represented, you, you don't want to draw this entire set of gates. You'd much rather just draw uh, a little box and, tell, and you know, describe what the inputs do. You'll notice that there is a, uh, a negation indicator on the S and the R, and this indicates that these are activated by lows. So a zero on this value should put a one out here, and a zero on reset should also put a one out here. And again, these two values you know, won't both be zero at the same time because it gives us a one and a one. So it'll be either you know one or the other ones of these will be zero. So if we start by at the top of the table by putting a zero and a zero into the device. And what we're going to end up with is, well, we have two NAND gates now, both of which have a zero in there, which means they cannot ever put out a zero, uh, just from uh, the truth tables that we, that we learned for, for, for NAND gates. So these outputs are both going to want to go to a, a one. Now this is already our prohibited condition. So when we have a set and a reset value, both zero, the outputs both want to go to one. So this is prohibited. This is not something we, we would like to see as an output on a, on a latch. So we'll take this prohibited condition out, and we'll go to the first val the next set of values in the table, which is a zero and a one. And again, as soon as I put a zero into this gate, it, the output is a one. This one then is fed back into the reset uh, gate terminal, and it goes, and the output is a one and a zero. So one and a zero. And as you recall, that uh, as soon as I put, I, I mentioned that as soon as you put a zero into onto one of these, it activates it, and the value, the, the the output directly across from it usually goes high. So in this case, set activated uh, Q, and we call this a a set condition because Q is high. If we go to the next value, a 1 and a 0, well, here's our 0 again. It means this output was going to go to a, a 1. This 1 will feed into the, into the NAND gate on set and causing this output to go to a 0. So I have a 0 and a 1, and this is called a reset condition because Q0 went high. And then the last position in the table is where both inputs are ones, and this one then is still present and returns to this input, and this zero returns here. A zero and a one give me a one, a one and a one give me a zero, and it looks like nothing has changed. So a one and a one on a NAND latch kept their same values, so we have a, a hold condition. I can also make an SR latch out of NOR gates, but the outputs are going to be the opposite of what they were in this table, and I'll show you that now. So here's our, our SR made from, from NOR gates, and notice now that there are no negation indicators on the set and reset, so we could probably guess that, a, that ones here cause Q to go high, or a one here causes Q not to go high. And so again, we'll just make something up, and we'll begin by saying that Q is a Q not is a zero, and Q is a one. Notice also that the outputs are reversed. In the NAND latch, the the Q was on the top. So starting with a zero and a zero. So we take this. We know that uh, it takes that any one on one of these inputs causes the output to go low. So we take the one that's fed into this. It causes the output to go low here, feeds the zero right back into this, and now I have a zero and a one, and nothing changed. So in this particular latch, a zero and a zero 
kept the one and the zero output that I had previously. So I had a, a hold state with a zero and a zero. A zero and a one. Well, as soon as I get a one, this output becomes a low. This low returns here. Two lows give me a high. So I have a zero and a one, and the condition is reset. And a one and a zero now. Well, as soon as I put a one in, zero comes out. The zero feeds back down here. A zero and a zero give me a one at the output. And now Q has gone high. Q naught is low, so we are in the set condition. The last condition I can have is a high on both of these inputs. As soon as either one of the inputs on the NOR gate has a high, the output is going to be a zero, and the output is going to be a zero. And as you recall, a zero and a zero, uh, non-complementary outputs, these are prohibited. So we have completed the table. And notice that it is indeed the opposite of the, of the NAND latch. Here's another SR NAND latch, but now I've added a, a pulse steering circuit in the form of these two NAND gates and this edge detector. And that changes our, our drawing up a little bit, but it also ch it changes the, the schematic symbol. And you'll notice now that we still have the S and R and the Q and the Q naught, but we now have this little triangular shape at this input. Well, this is where our clock is going to come in, and this triangle gives us some specific information. It's telling us that we are working off of a positive edge. If we have a clock pulse, we actually have two edges. We have a leading edge where the the, the signal goes, the clock goes from a 0 to a 1, and then we have a trailing edge where the clock goes from a 1 to a 0. Well, this is the positive edge, and this is the, the negative edge. And we might also call this the leading edge and the trailing edge. So the leading edge, positive edge, and the trailing edge, negative edge. And what happens, the data that's on the inputs the, on A and B, or set and reset, will only go through these two NAND gates when we actually have a positive or negative edge. It's that short period when there's a one present. So there's a very tiny period where there's a one present on both of these inputs in which the data can go from, in, from these inputs into the next stage of our, of our flip-flop. And I'll talk about that shortly. For right now, let's just assume that at these inputs I have uh, either ones or zeros for my clock. So let's start with zeros for the clock, uh, just, to, just to begin. And again, just make some value up for the output. And I think you'll recall that as long as I have a zero on, into a NAND gate, the output is always going to be a one. Well, now I'm dependent on the output for this gate from the previous inputs. So this one goes into the gate there, this zero comes into this. Well, a 1 and a 1 gave me a 0, and a 0 and a 1 gives me the 1. So there was no change. So as long as there's an absence of a, a clock or an edge, all of these four positions are a hold condition. So let's put a clock in there and see how things change. So I'll put a 1 into the gate and, and pick the first value off the table. A zero and a zero. Well, a zero and a one. Again, it's a one and a one. Well, it looks like we're back into the hold condition. So the zero feeds in here. The one feeds up into this. And once again, uh, I'm left with the same thing I had from the previous state. A zero and a one, which was a, a hold. Well, the next value on the table is a 0 and a 1. And the 1 and the 1 then give me a 0 out. 
a 0 and a 1 give me a 1 out. This 1 feeds back into the gate, outputting a 0. And this 0 comes down here, and I again have a 1. And you would think it's a hold condition, but it just happens to be the same thing as I had from the, uh, the Q and the Q naught. This is actually um, a reset condition. So when I had a 0 on set, the output on Q was also a low. So it's a 0 and a 1. So for this particular instance, I had a reset condition. If I change these two, to a 1 and a 0. Now I have a 1 and a 1. That outputs a 0. A 0 and a 1. That outputs a 1. As soon as I have a 0 coming into this gate, this has to transition to a, a 1. This one then feeds back into the gate here, and a one and a one give me a zero. So now uh, a one on set gave me a high on Q. So I was in the set condition. And finally, I can put a one on both of these gates. And now I have two zeros. And again, any time I have a zero into one of the into a NAND gate, the output wants to be a one. So it wants to be a one and a one. The the values have to be complementary. I cannot have Q and Q not both high. So this is prohibited. So let's take a look at how a edge detector actually works. Uh, again, we're we're going to ignore the speed of light and, and assume that the, that the clock pulse, when it comes in, is just going to go down to this wire instantaneously. And, well, that tells us that when this goes positive, it's going to occur instantly at this input in pin number one. So we have a, a really fast transition through here. Well, before this clock pulse came in, or up to this point, the output of this inverter was positive. And then when the clock goes positive, the output wants to go negative. Well, there's a period of time that it takes for the input to go through the inverter and change to a negative value. And that period of time, as you recall, is a propagation delay. And if we have a, a really short propagation delay, let's say 20 nanoseconds, which is not unreasonable, uh, the it takes 20 nanoseconds then for the output of this inverter to go from a high to a low. So it's during that short period when both of the inputs are high caused by that propagation delay that we actually have a high out of our NAND gate. So that positive edge occurs only during that short propagation delay period caused by the inverter. The negative edge detector works pretty much the same way, but now we're looking for lows on the input of both of these uh, on both of these inputs to the AND gate. So we're, working, we're looking for a low here. So while this clock, or when this clock goes low, that low is felt right away here. But remember that while this was high, it takes a few seconds for that transition, that low transition, to be felt at this input. So that low transition causes the output here to go high. But during that little 20 nanosecond period, when we have a propagation delay and this clock input to number two is still low, well, that's when we have simultaneous lows. When this low actually gets through here after that 20 nanosecond period, when that low gets through there, we now have a high out here because it gets inverted and that edge is gone. So we only have a negative edge during a very short period of time shown here. And that's a uh, in a nutshell, a basic explanation of how an edge detector might work. A flip-flop you don't see anymore as far as just a dedicated device is the T-type. A T-flip-flop toggles 
long as there is a one present on this input and we have a clock at, at on, on the clock input what's going to happen is that the Q and the Q knots are just going to flip back and forth they're going to go from 0 to 1 to 0 to 1 what I'll end up with at the output here is a 0 1 0 1 0 and so on and so forth for the Q's and of course the Q naught would have to be 1 0 1 0 1 but what happens is that these flipping values uh, these transitional values only occur on an edge so these values only occur for example on this positive edge uh, transition in here and here what this is going to do is it's actually going to cut this frequency in half so if this was transitioning at a rate of uh, one clock pulse every second this zero is going to be present for one second and then the one is going to be present for one second so now the entire period of this clock pulse actually takes two seconds what we have is a is a device called a frequency divider and by putting several of these together I can make multiple frequencies out of out of just a few t-type flip-flops as I said the t-type flip-flop really doesn't you know it's not a dedicated device anymore there is no IC that is a t-type flip-flop but we can make them out of d-types uh, which we're going to talk about shortly and of course the JK uh, which we'll also talk about shortly so here's the d-type and it's also called a transparent latch or a data latch it's called a transparent latch because as long as it's enabled or clocked and uh, they might call this an enable position or a clock position and again I drew it without a any kind of edge detector but if you look at this drawing you'll notice that it's a uh, I used a negative edge detector this would actually be a, a 74 74 uh, IC for if you were using a TTL well it's called a transparent latch because as long as the device is enabled or there's a negative edge clock pulse whatever appears on D appears on Q as well so if you have a 0 on D you'll get a 0 on Q and if you have a 1 on D you'll have a 1 on Q with the complementary value on on Q naught and that's why they call it a, a transparent latch it's also called a, a, a data latch because essentially it is a it's, it's used quite often as a as a data device in shift registers uh, and it's also a delay latch because what it does is it delays the transition of the data or the information here to the output so let's start by uh, just putting a zero on the enable and a zero on the data well doing that we end up with a zero and a zero and we get a one out and then we have a one going into this gate now notice what happens this looks a lot like an SR latch and it really is with the, with one difference in that there is no no R or clear input what you've done or what they've done is they've taken the output of this of what would have been the set and fed it into the the reset and what this does it prevents that prohibited condition because this value that's coming out of here is always going to be inverted from these two inputs so no matter what happens this output will be the opposite of this va value per and that prevents that prohibited condition and again let's make up a value and so we're going to have a 1 on this input and a 0 and a 1 on this input so we end up with 1's all around the 1 then returns here and the 0 returns here and a 1 and a 1 gives us a 0 so as long as this enable is low we're in a hold condition so anytime you have a low on enable you're in a hold and whatever the previous condition was it's just going to stay the same so let's enable the device now 
and let's go to uh, do the one and the one. So we have a one and we're enabled so the one and the one will give us a a low and this low will be returned to the gate here along with a one outputting a one on that gate. Well as soon as there's a zero on the input of this gate the output will transition to a one because it can't be anything other than a one with a zero at the input. The one is going to feed back into this gate. We're going to end up with two highs causing this to be low. So as you can see that when the data was high and the chip was enabled, the output on Q was also high. If we then pick the other value, put a zero into it, well the one and the zero give us a one at the output. That one is returned here. The output of this gate is zero, which instantly puts a one at the output because we cannot ever have a, uh, a zero out once we have a zero in. The one feeds in to this gate and causes the output to go low. So again, everything matches up. When data is zero, the output is a zero as well. And of course, this would be a considered a reset condition if we had such a condition in here, and a set condition. So what would a chip look like, or what would the, uh, the pinout for a chip look like for a, a 74, uh, 74, the D-type? Um, well, there are two ways that it can be expressed. On the 7474s, there are actually two uh, complete D-type circuits. And notice that on this one, there's, a, there's also a clear and a preset function. Uh, in in the simple block or the, the simple gate diagram that I had in the previous circuit, I didn't include presets and clears as, as values. So the preset, uh, which is can also be called a set. So if you see something called a, a set and a clear or a set and a reset, again, it's it's just an interchangeable term. But there are two of them uh, on the chip. There are two complete D types. So there's going to be preset one and clear one for the first one and clear two and preset two for the second uh, D-type uh, flip-flop. Then it has a, a clock for the first one and a clock for the second one. And, and this is a little inconvenient to look at so there's also another uh, method and that's uh, for, for describing the gate and, and that's shown here and this one kind of bundles the, uh, the gate together and, but the pins are no longer in order, so uh, the, the preset for uh, the first D-type is on pin 4, and the clear for the first one is on pin 1. So it's not in, in pin order, it's actually just in, in functional, or, or it's done by a block description. And, and I really do, I pref personally I prefer this one because it just makes it easier to, to kind of work in, in, in a unit. It's easier for me to see. What's shown here is a JK flip-flop, and this is kind of like the queen mother of all flip-flops because it can do the functions of every one of the, of the flip-flops we've talked about. It can operate as an SR, it can operate as a toggle or T-type, and it can operate as a D-type. Um, some of the interesting things about it are that it can operate synchronously and asynchronously. When it's operating asynchronously, the set or the resets have been activated or we've turned the clock off. But let's talk about these sets and resets first. And I say these are asynchronous functions because if I put a zero on set or a zero on reset, it doesn't matter what's occurring in this section in here. And that's better shown right up here. Notice that these are marked preset and clear. Well, those are again synonymous terms with reset and preset is synonymous with set. So if you see it called either one of these, it's really the same thing. 
But again, if, uh, if I put a low on preset, as soon as I put a low on preset, Q will go high. And by definition, uh, we always want these values to be complementary, so Q naught must, must go low. At the same time, if I had a if I had a zero on clear, it it's, it asserts it, it tends Q to a high and Q not to a low. So now it's looking like an SR. But this has a prohibited condition as well, because you can imagine uh, inadvertently putting lows on both of these. And what's going to happen is it, you're going to attempt to send both of these outputs, Q and Q naught, both to high. And this, of course, would be a prohibited condition. So all lows on the set and clear, or the preset in the clear, would be a prohibited condition. And as I just showed you, if I put a low on set or preset, as soon as I put a low here, I get a one out. And if you did the same thing on reset, it would be a zero and a one. And of course, we have a, a set condition and a, and a clear condition or, or reset. And these are asynchronous modes because what we've done is we've overridden the clock. Even if there was a clock present, it wouldn't matter. Uh, we've actually just, we've, we've overridden it. If I were operating this with ones on both presets and clears, well, now I'm going back to depending on what's on the value, on the values of these selections. So you can imagine, well, if, what if I put a zero into this? And again, just make some value up for the output. Uh, and let's put a zero and a one in this. Well, a zero and a zero is gonna give me a one and a 0 and a 1 is also going to give me a 1. Well, the 1 from this gate will feed here, and the 0 from this point will feed here. So I have all 1s on this gate, which is going to keep the output 0, and then I have a 0 on this gate, keeping the output as a 1. So on a JK, it, as long as there is no clock present, it's also in a hold condition. And so no clock, we're in a hold condition. I'm going to keep preset and clear deactivated by keeping ones on them, and we're just going to look at the rest of the table. And we'll start with the, the presence of a clock, so we'll just put a one in. Even though it's an edge detector, we'll just treat this as a, as a level detector device. And we'll start with a zero and a zero. So a zero and a one, a one, and a one. I still have the one from the previous state. I still have the one feeding in here. And I end up with the same condition. So when J and K are all zeros, I ended up with the same thing that I had before. And that was actually a, a 1 and a 0. So I had a, a hold condition. So I had a hold when I had zeros on both J and K. Going to the next one, putting a 1 on K. So I'm going to put a 1 on K. A 1 and a 1 outputs a zero. As soon as I get a zero on this input, the output goes high. This drives it high to this point. Uh, the zero on the one here, give me a one. All highs here, well that's going to give me a zero. So a one on K gives me a one on Q naught. And I really have a, a reset condition or a clear condition again. All right, so putting in a, a 1 and a 0, so I have a 1 here from my enables. I have a 0 being fed back here and a 1 being fed into this. 
So all ones gives me a zero out. The zero going into the the nor the OR gate with the inverter outputs a a one. And then the one feeds down this way, and I have a one coming in there. So I have all ones, and that outputs a zero on the lower gate. And again, everything's working fine, and I am in a set condition. Well, the last condition I can have is toggle mode. And in that condition, I probably say one on both of these inputs. So working from this first set of values, um, I'm going to take the, the one that's here. It gets fed into the gate at this point. Uh, the zero gets fed into this gate. As soon as I have a zero in, I get a one out, and I have all ones, so I get a zero out at this point. As soon as I get a zero in, this toggles to a one. This one then feeds into the gate up here, and I have all ones, and that causes this output to be a zero. And if I repeat the procedure again, once again, this is just going to toggle to a from a zero to a one, and so forth. And and just like the T-type, what it'll do is if this is a, a a one millisecond clock pulse coming in, this is going to change from zero to one every two milliseconds. So again, it acts as a frequency divider. So what are some applications for uh, JK flip-flops and, and, and D-types, etc.? Well, one of them one of the applications you've already worked with, if, if you recall the, the video from the monostable circuit, you can use a, a NAND latch as a, as a monostable triggering device. And this puts out a very nice clean pulse uh, every time that you, that you trigger it over here. Uh, so that's one application. This is a synchronous up counter. So this device will actually count from uh, zero, you know, from 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to 1, 1, 1, 1. So, so 0 up to 15, or in hexadecimal, from 0 up to, up to F. And this is done synchronously because the clock is attached to each one of the flip-flops. There is another device, the asynchronous up counter, in which the clock is only attached to the, to the first, uh, JK, and then the Qs are used to clock the, the subsequent circuits. And this is called a this is a this is a ripple counter, so this is a an asyn this is a synchronous uh, up counter, and then we have this last one, and this is a this is a a, a serial shift register. I can uh, put data into uh, the flip flop uh, by you know, transferring it somehow. So I'm just making the uh, in this drawing we're just putting data into this first flip flop. Uh, we start out with everything reset. Uh, so we clear it out, we press this toggle switch for just a moment, and that clears everything out, turn all your LEDs off. Uh, we put some data into this, on this input, and then we trigger it. And let's say we, if we put a 1 on there, trigger this, we're going to shift, uh, shift this 1 out, and the 0 that was here gets shifted out, and the 0 that was here gets shifted out, and so on. And what's going to happen, if you don't add any more data into this, each time you trigger it, this one is going to shift over one register. So this is a serial shift register, and this happens to be a shift right. You can also have them which do shift left, and then there are, of course, parallel registers. But these are just a couple of applications. and Hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be able to, to use them shortly. I hope that you uh, found the information here informative. If you have any any questions or comments, please leave them in the, in the comments section, and thank you for your time.